Treatment of osteoarthritis. I am on page 951 if you're following along. The goal is to reduce pain, maximize mobility, and minimize disability. The three major ways that we accomplish this is through physical therapy, drug therapy, and surgery. We'll talk about physical therapy first. And before I get into physical therapy, give you just a brief uh, idea of what a physical therapist is. And imagine, okay, nursing, we get our orders from a doctor, right? That's what nurses do. We carry out doctor's orders, among other things. I mean, we assess and all of that. But let's say this is a real typical order. It'll say routine vital signs. So, yes, the doctor has told us to check and monitor the vital signs. But there's so much more that goes into it than that. So routine vital signs. We know that that means every eight hours we're going to check their vital signs no matter what. It also means that we're going to call the physician if something changes dramatically or is way out of whack. We're also going to check blood pressure and heart rate before we give blood pressure medicine or heart medication. If they're seeming like they're something's wrong, we're going to take the vital signs. If we're going to call the doctor, we're going to check the vital signs right before we call the doctor. If we notice that they look flushed, or feel warm to us, we're going to check their temperatures. So just because the doctor wrote routine vital signs, that doesn't really mean a lot because the nurse decides a lot about how how often what needs to be done on vital signs. Well, it's the same way with physical therapy. A doctor has to write an order that will say something like this. Um, it'll, it'll be on the patient's chart. Physical therapy, three times a week, two hours a day, something like that. And that's it. That's the doctor's done. And that's where the physical therapist comes in and then interprets that just like the nurse decides what's meant by routine vital signs. The physical therapist decides how to increase the activity, what types of activity needs to be done, all of that kind of thing. And so they get their orders from the doctor just like we do, but again, it's it's up for a lot of interpretation, and so that's why a physical therapist has to have just as much schooling as a nurse does. So, two specific things. Um, we want to promote exercise, but we want it to be the right kind. And so if they're not under the specific instructions of a physical therapist, nurses, sometimes that's one of the hats that we wear is we act as physical therapists because that's part of nursing too. But the purpose of exercise is to increase muscle mass and that can relieve a lot of the pressure off of the joints. My husband occasionally has back problems because of his occupation and several times he's been to the doctor and one thing that the doctor always tells him is that the, the best thing you can do for your back is to have strong abs. And so he's always encouraging him to do abdominal exercises to tighten those ab muscles because the more that your abdominal muscles take, the less that your back has to take. So increasing your muscle mass and muscle strength is going to take pressure off of the joints. Two types of exercise that you're going to hear talked about a lot are isotonic and isometric. Isotonic, this word um, tonic means movement, and so it's any type of exercise that involves movement. So lifting weights. Um, I'm picturing someone doing bicep curls, so they're going up and down and up and down and up and down, so there's a lot of movement there. And then obvious sports like jogging, rowing, playing basketball, those are all isotonic, and those type of things can be pretty hard on the joints because there's always going to be movement involved. Isometric are exercises that exercise the muscles without necessarily having much joint movement. And the first thing that came to my mind was yoga and Pilates, although in this picture you can see that there's quite a bit of pressure here on the knee and on the wrist, so not all isometric exercises are created equal. You certainly wouldn't want to do this if you were having knee or wrist problems, but you get the idea that isometric is when you exercise the muscle, put it to work, but it doesn't involve the joint movement. Other things that we want to teach the client to do are to alternate activity with rest. They may not be able to go all day long like they did when they were younger. Cushion shoes was something else that your book mentioned. 
And there's a lot of things like that. That's where occupational therapy also comes in handy is because they are fabulous at coming up with little cheats, I'll call them, things that allow people to do things that they normally couldn't do, like walk or a lot or, or stand on their feet when they're having problems like osteoarthritis, get some cushion shoes and voila, um, you got another two, three years out of your knees just from that. Application of heat and cold. We're going to make a care plan here pretty soon that will um, have that as part of it. Heat is great for reducing muscle spasm and encouraging um, blood flow, circulation, healing. Cold is a great way to reduce inflammation. A lot of times we'll use both on our patients with osteoarthritis or other joint disorders. We might alternate them because they need both. And then finally, a TENS device. I've never used one of these and very rarely have I seen a patient use them. Mostly people use these at home, but here is a, a pregnant woman and she's obviously got some back pain, maybe sciatic back pain, but she's applied this TENS device and it's in your book. It stands for transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Transcutaneous means trans through, cutaneous through the skin. So it's going to attach to the skin. There's no needles involved here. It just attaches to the skin and it sends an electrical stimulation of some kind through the skin to reach the, the joints or muscles or whatever it's trying to get to. Nerve stimulation is what it says in your book. But there's no breaking of the skin involved. So that's important. The T is transcutaneous. Drug therapy. And I said we were going to talk more about this in pharmacology and we will, but it just wouldn't make sense to not briefly mention it here. The probably most common drug that people are going to use with osteoarthritis are NSAIDs. I already mentioned that before. It stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are things like Advil, ibuprofen, um, Aleve, naproxen, and we'll talk more about those in pharmacology, but that's the things we're talking about. A lot of these are available over the counter, and anti-inflammatory, it's in the name. That's exactly what they do is they relieve inflammation or reduce inflammation. They have been associated with bleeding disorders. In fact, if you read the back of a bottle of ibuprofen, it will say don't take if you have um, ulcers or if you have severe abdominal pain or or notice blood in your stool you, you have to report it to the doctor so that's a, an issue with the NSAIDs. Salicylates basically that's aspirin and I, why we can't just call it aspirin I don't know but aspirin even more so than NSAIDs poses a bleeding risk so that limits the amount of aspirin that someone can take over a long period of time. Autotoxicity, we're going to cover what that means if you don't already know in pharmacology, but autotoxicity means um, damage to the eighth cranial nerve or hearing, it has to do with your hearing. And so when someone has a toxic amount of salicylates or aspirin, it can knock out their hearing and it can be permanent. The damage can be permanent. So they might have ringing in the ears all the way up to deafness in the ears. And Aspirin has also been associated with some confusion in the older adult. And it seems like sometimes when you work in a nursing home or long-term term care, you think they're all confused, and we certainly don't want to add to that. But that's not true. It's just the ones that aren't confused aren't in the nursing homes, right? Finally, we have um, supplements. And again, these are not regulated by the same entity that regulates drugs. They're considered more like a food and these are on the top of page 951. It talks about glucosamine and chondroitin. A lot of times they're combined into one. And a lot of people swear by them. They take them every day. They make probably a million dollars in sales a year. But the research I have is just not robust. Robust means it's got a great um, sample size and it's a blind or double blind study. and we just don't have that with most supplements. So efficacy means how, how well it works is based on anecdotal reports. So it's based on a lot of people saying, you know, I had all this pain and I took glucosamine and I felt better. 
and there's some credibility to that. That's why it's sales, but it's not considered robust enough to qualify as being a, a legitimate medication. And then finally, glucocorticoid injections. So here we have non-steroidal glucocorticoids are steroids. So here's the difference. This is a steroid. NSAIDs are non-steroidal. Now you can take steroids, glucocorticoids, um, PO, prednisone is probably a, a pretty common one. They don't seem to help very well with this problem, but the injections do. And so if you've ever heard, I've heard of a lot of people that go to the doctor, especially for the near, their knee, and they'll get this injection right into the joint. And it is a painful injection, but it provides almost immediate relief. It reduces the inflammation. However, you can see here, we're limited to three or four times a year. And people I know that have these, it lasts about two weeks and then they're right back to where they were. And so this is a very um, short term solution to their problem. If you haven't done so, go ahead and complete this, this part of the study guide. And so our final, we talked about physical therapy, medications, and now we're to surgery. And generally, those other two will have been tried first. So surgery is the last resort. And arthroplasty is the type of arthroscopic surgery that removes loose bodies and repairs defects. This is a very common type of surgery, especially knees. Um, sometimes hips. The primary indication is intractable pain. Intractable generally means that you've tried other methods. You've tried going through physical therapy, hot and cold. You've used the, your maxing out on the NSAIDs and you're still not getting the pain relief that you need. Things are getting worse instead of better. You've had your three, four glucocorticoid injections already this year and there's nothing else left. So then we can do surgery. Interestingly, fake joints, which is what they're going to do, they're going to take out your real joint and put in a fake one, but they have an expiration date. And now it doesn't necessarily have the expiration date written on there, so don't misunderstand me like that. It just means that they don't seem to last forever, which explains, and you'll see this oh, kind of in the middle of surgical management on page 951, it says, some experts recommend delaying joint replacement until age 60 because of the risk of prosthesis failure during the expected lifetime. You don't want these things to wear out before you die because even though we can do a revision, they usually suck. And I have seen so many revisions where they had a, their initial knee replacement maybe in their 30s, they hit 60 or so, it has to have a revision and they just are not very good. And you're your book tells you they have a high failure rate. So the more revisions someone has, it seems like the worse they get. So that's why a lot of times um, a physician will really try to delay any type of joint replacement surgery until after the, the 60s because, or age-wise after 60s, because they are going to um, wear out and you sure don't want to have to have, have them replaced if you don't have to. According to your book, the four most common joint replacement surgeries are knee, hip, shoulder, and then they have elbow, although I have never seen one. I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of knees, hundreds, if not thousands of hips, quite a few shoulders, but I have never seen an elbow, although there is a picture of what a replacement elbow looks like on page 953. So I guess they are done. I just haven't seen them. I'll pause now and when we come back we'll talk about um, what we do in the post-op because a lot of the patients that we're going to have at clinical have had joint replacement surgeries, they're out of the hospital, they're ready for their rehab process and post-op is what we're going to be doing.